everyone, and welcome to Under the Fig Tree. This is Troy, and I'm be flying solo uh, on this episode. Uh, before we get started, I do want to kind of recognize some folks. Uh, we have some listeners out in Singapore that we want to say hello to, and we also have some listeners in Borneo. Like that's weird, man. Listeners in Borneo, but we want to say hello to them as well along with our listeners here in the United States, uh, here in the Charlotte area. A lot of listeners here in the Charlotte area, we welcome you to Under the Fig Tree. Uh, Out in Abilene, Texas, we welcome you to Under the Fig Tree and a host of others. The the fig tree is growing, and we're beginning to leave a footprint in uh, different places, and it's all to the glory of our God Uh, He's helped us to have a voice here in the earth. And uh, somehow people seem to be getting enjoyment out of what we're doing here on Under the Fig Tree. So we thank you for your participation and your listenership. And uh, again, we welcome you to Under the Fig Tree. Today, there's a topic that I do want to talk about and uh, bring this to your attention. Uh, There's a specific design uh, that God had uh, in place for us. Uh, he's always wanted this from us, I believe. And I will point this out along the way. There's a couple of things I do want to point out along the way as we read through the text. But if we have to give this a topic today, I would say be fruitful will be our topic. Be fruitful. God has always wanted us to be fruitful And sometimes we don't necessarily know what being fruitful means. Uh, Usually we relegate being fruitful to uh, physically reproducing yourself. Uh, But there's also a spiritual fruitfulness that we'll get into here in a minute. But either way, we can look at it starting in Genesis 1. For you guys that have been with us under the fig tree uh, for any amount of time, you've probably heard me say this. There's so much about life you can learn just from the first four chapters of, of the Bible in the book of Genesis, so much you can learn about life. So we're in Genesis one verse 11 says this. Then God said, let the earth bring forth grass, the herb that yields seed and the fruit tree that yields fruit according to its kind, whose seed is in itself on the earth. And it was so, so God Wanted to bring forth, like I said, the grass, the herbs, all this stuff, and anything that yielded seed and the fruit trees that yielded fruit. Now, if you know anything about fruit, a fruit is a fruit because it contains a seed. And so uh, the fruit of something is only due to the seed that's in it. So there's a principle that God's going to lay out here in just a moment. And we, and I want you to be able to catch hold of this principle. We're going to jump down to verse 13. It says, and the earth brought forth grass, the herb that yields seed according to its kind and the tree that yields fruit whose seed is in itself according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. So this principle that God lays out affects everything. And the principle is simply this, that everything will produce after its own kind according to the seed that's in it. Everything will produce after its own kind, according to the seed that's in it. So when God needed or wanted to make more trees, he didn't have to keep saying, let there be trees, let there be trees. He didn't have to keep saying that with the grass. He didn't have to keep saying that with everything. What he did was he created it with the seed in itself so that it could replicate itself by doing exactly what it was designed to do. So a tree would not replicate or the tree would not produce grass because the seed that's in the tree is not conducive to produce grass. The seed that's in the tree would only produce the seed or the tree, which matches the seed that's inside of that tree. It can only produce after its own kind, according to the seed that's in it. So anything that is replicated from that is referred to as fruit. So when a new tree comes up based on the seed that's in the previous tree, 
then this new tree is the fruit of that previous tree. No different than the grass. No different than you or I. We were made to replicate ourselves here in the earth. And we will replicate ourselves according to the seed that we have in us. God lays this out. This is a principle. He says this will continue. Genesis 8.22 says this. While the earth remains seed time and harvest time, cold and heat, winter and summer, and day and night shall not cease. So as long as the earth remains, there will be seed time and harvest time. This means that, that things God created will always have the ability to replicate themselves as long as the earth is remaining. A good way to look at this and, and to look at this in our spiritual uh, connotation. Jesus says this to his disciples. He says, go out into the world, preach the gospel and make disciples. He didn't tell them to make church members because he's not talking to church members. He didn't tell them to uh, uh, build social clubs because he's not talking to guys that are in social clubs. He's talking to disciples and he says, go make disciples. The seed that's in you is a seed of discipleship. Go replicate yourself. Go into the world, preach this gospel, the same thing I gave to you. Go give that to somebody else and replicate yourself. Just as you're a disciple, make other disciples. God says to us to be fruitful. This is one of the first things he said to mankind. When he said to be fruitful, this was not a suggestion. This was a command. Be fruitful. Be fruitful. It is a command. You are commanded, and I, just as I am commanded, to be fruitful. We should always be producing fruit. Now, since we know that we have the ability to produce fruit, and since we know that everything will produce after its own kind, it would behoove us to make sure that we have the right seed. Genesis 2 says this, and the Lord God, I'm in verse 7, and the Lord God formed man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living being. So when Adam was created, he became a living being. Adam was created with seed in him. Okay? Therefore, when he had the seed in him, he could produce something like him as long as he had somewhere to put the seed. Now, of course, uh, the woman was created and she was pulled out of the side of man. So now this seed that Adam has, has a place to be deposited. And now Adam can replicate himself. Now, this is the, the cool thing. Adam is in a sinless state when he's, created and eventually Adam did fall. Now I want you to see this when Adam was created, God said this, he said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. And so Adam was created in the image of God after God's likeness. This is the seed that was deposited in Adam. Adam, because of his free will, Adam decided to rebel against God and he chose his wife over God. And in doing so, the seed that was in Adam changed. So this spotless seed that Adam had is no longer spotless. It has flaws. It has blemishes. It has what people don't like to talk about too much today. It has sin. And now this seed is no longer pure. And since the seed is not pure any longer, something had to be put in place later on down the road. But before we get to that, I want you to see this. Adam did not have children until after he was put out of the garden. If Adam would have had children in his sinless state, 
then the children that Adam would have produced would have been sinless because the seed that was in Adam had not changed yet. But once Adam sinned, now the seed changes. Now that principle that God laid out from the beginning affects Adam too, that everything produces after its own kind according to the seed that's in it. Since that seed now changed and that seed now has sin, now the seed that Adam produces or the fruit that comes from Adam has to be like Adam. We can look at the text and we can see this in the text. If you go to Genesis 5, verse 1, it talks about the genealogy of the book of Adam. It says, this is the genealogy of Adam. In the day that God created man, he made him in the likeness of God. So when he created Adam, he made him in the likeness of God. He was like God. He created them male and female and blessed them and called them Adam in the day they were created. Now here's where it gets funny in verse three. And Adam lived 130 years and begot a son. Listen to this in his own likeness after his image and named him Seth. This is Adam in his fallen state. And now in his fallen state, he produces a son. And, and it starts here with, in the genealogy. It starts with Seth. There's a reason it starts with Seth and not Cain and Abel. Uh, I wish I had a lot of, I wish I had more time. I could talk to you about that. But it's just funny how when God forgives you, he can put things in the past as if they didn't exist. So when the books of Adam are written, when the book is written for Adam's genealogy, it doesn't start with the past mistakes. It starts with Seth. But that's a different topic altogether. Uh, we can do that some other time. In this case, Seth is created after Adam's likeness. Look at the text. And after Adam's image. Hmm. Why? Because Adam can no longer produce something sinless. He has sin. And so now the only thing he can produce is something that's like him because everything produces after its own kind, according to the seed that's in it. There was, however, a remedy for this. God put something in place to remedy this. Remember, even when the man fell in the garden, there was something interesting that God said to the woman. And, and uh, let me say it the right way. There was something interesting he said to the serpent. He said, I will put enmity between your seed and her seed, and the seed of the woman will crush the head of the seed of the serpent. Now, we all know women don't have seed. But he said the seed of the woman will crush the head of the seed of the serpent. If you walk through the book with me, then you'll recognize in the story that an angel approached Mary, said she was highly favored above all other women, and told her she would have a child and she would name him Jesus. He would be the savior of the world. And she said, how can this be being that I have not been with a man? And the angel said, the Holy Spirit will overshadow you. So what ends up happening is there is a seed that's placed inside of Mary. She's given a seed. No man could father Jesus because man's blood was already tainted. Well, I hear you. Well, why does that matter? Well, this is why it matters. Because without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. And in order for the blood to remit the sin, the blood needed to be pure. In order for the blood to be pure, it couldn't come from an impure man. Why? Because everything produces after its own kind, according to the seed that's in it. And man's blood was already tainted with sin. 
So God had to give Mary a seed that contained pure blood. If you, if and I'm sure there's some of you guys that will probably fact check us and and probably get back to us if I'm incorrect on this, but I don't believe I am. Uh, if you study out biology, then you'll see the nourishment for a child in the womb comes from the mother. The blood that the child has comes from the father. The nourishment, all the nutrients, all that stuff, that comes from the mother in the womb. But the blood comes from the father. So again, no man could father Jesus because his blood was already tainted. And so God gave her a seed with pure blood. And now Jesus is born into the earth through the womb of a woman, which gives him legal right to be here in the earth and to operate. Jesus dies for our sins. He sheds his blood. He pays the ultimate price. He ransoms us. He died a death that we should have died. And he died in our place for something we did. He had no sin. So he died for something we did. And I thank God for that. But he became what we did so that we could become who he is. And so now you can say that you are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus because of the price that was paid by Christ. So now when Christ is raised from the dead, here's the remedy. Jesus goes to his disciples. Now you're going to see a couple of funny things here. And it's really hard for me to talk about this stuff without mentioning certain things. Okay. So one thing you'll notice uh, in John chapter 20 it says this, I mean, verse one, now on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb early while it was still dark and saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. Then she ran and came to Simon Peter and the other disciples whom Jesus loved and said to them, they have taken away the Lord out of the tomb and we do not know where they have laid him. Peter therefore went out and the other disciple and were going to the tomb. So they both ran together and the other disciple outran Peter and came to the tomb first. I love how John <laughs> writes about himself. <laughs> yeah, he is the other disciple and he's like, yeah, I ran Peter. I got there before he did. And he's stooping down and looking in, saw the linen cloth lying there yet did not go in. Then Simon Peter came following him and went into the tomb and he saw the linen clothes lying there and the handkerchief that had been around his head, not lying with the linen cloths, but folded together in a place by itself. Then the other disciple who came to the tomb first went in also, and he saw and believed. For as yet they did not know the scripture that he must rise again from the dead. Then the disciples went away again to their own homes. So inside this tomb, um, they, they can see Jesus is not there any, any longer. Now here's where it really gets good. But Mary stood outside the tomb weeping. And as she wept, she stooped down and looked in the tomb. Verse 12. And she saw two angels in white, one sitting at the head and the other at the feet where the body of Jesus had lain. And they said to her woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, because they have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. Now, if you understand the Old Testament and you, you understand that there's symbolism, a lot of times there's uh, shadows in the Old Testament that point to a reality. One of those shadows and a major shadow in the Old Testament or a type, um, when you start studying typology, shadows and different things like that, you will see inside that tabernacle are tons and tons of types and shadows inside of the, the tabernacle. One being the Ark of the Covenant. And uh, there, there's a teaching we can do on the Ark of the Covenant. Uh, we may do a podcast just on tabernacle. It'll probably take us forever because there's so much in there. 
Uh, but the Ark of the Covenant, if you remember, at the top of the Ark of the Covenant, uh, there was a cover. And on top of that cover, there were two cherubim. Uh, cherub being another word or type of an angel or heavenly being, I should say. Anytime you put an I am at the end of the word in the Hebrew, it makes it plural. So you have cherubim. Uh, there were two of them sitting on top of the Ark, Ark of the Covenant, and they were facing one another. Their wings were stretched forward, and the wings were touching. Okay? So you had this flat panel, and the two angels sitting on top of it, facing one another. Um, when these scriptures are written, and there's great detail, there's a reason for the detail. So when we go back to John 20, verse 11, I'll read it again. But Mary stood outside the, by the tomb weeping, and as she wept, she stooped down and looked into the tomb. Now look at this, verse 12. And she saw two angels in white sitting, one at the head and the other at the feet where the body of Jesus had been laid. And Jesus was laid inside of a tomb on top of a sepulcher, which is a flat piece of rock. And it says specifically one angel was sitting on one end and the other angel was sitting on the other end. Now, if, if you look at that image and you get that image in your mind, it does not look exactly like the top of the Ark of the Covenant, but it looks similar. This, this is how shadows work. Your shadow doesn't look exactly like you. It looks very similar, though. And so right now what she's seeing, she's seeing what we would call the mercy seat. This is the picture that she's getting. Now, she may not recognize this is what she's getting, but this is the picture of what she's getting. She's getting a picture of the mercy seat. Why? Because mercy's coming. Jesus is gone. He has to do business. He has to present his blood in, in the, the holiest of holies. Um, but instead of judgment, now there's going to be mercy. Now, now look at this. Then they said to her, woman, why weep? Why are you weeping? She said to them, because they have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. Now, when she had said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there and did not know that it was Jesus. She saw Jesus standing there, but did not know that it was him. Jesus said unto her, Woman, why are you weeping? Who are you seeking? Now, look at this. She, supposing him to be the gardener, said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. Now, the Bible tells us she saw Jesus standing there, but did not recognize it was Jesus standing there but she supposed him to be the gardener. Now, when I go all the way back to Genesis, there was a command that God gave Adam outside of being fruitful, multiplying, subduing, have dominion, and, and, and uh, filling the earth. Besides that command, he said, I want you to dress this garden and keep it. If Adam was to dress a garden and keep the garden, doesn't that make Adam a gardener? When Mary is in this garden, she sees Jesus, but supposes him to be a gardener. What Mary is actually seeing here, and, and it wasn't until Jesus spoke her name that she recognized it was Jesus. But what she's seeing here, what she gets the privilege of seeing is this is what man was always supposed to be before the seed changed. She sees Jesus, supposes him to be the gardener. When the original man, Adam, was placed inside of a garden and told to dress it and keep it. A sinless Adam in a garden 
And now you have a sinless risen savior in a garden. And she sees this is the original design of mankind. This is what you were always supposed to be. Not the gardener that you were always supposed to be, but this is the state that you were always supposed to be in. Jesus has a remedy. Uh, and, and going back to that, he did remedy the situation. God remedied the situation through Jesus. I should say it that way. And, and this is how. In John chapter 20, right there where we were, you have to drop down to verse 19. It says, then the same day at evening, being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut, when the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood in the midst of them and said, peace be unto you. When he had said this, pay attention to this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. So Jesus said to them again, peace be unto you. As the father has sent me, I also send you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said, receive you the Holy spirit. Hmm. This is what happens. Okay. Jesus said this thing. He says, I only say what I hear my father say, and I only do what I see my father do. When Adam was created, the Bible says that God breathed into Adam and he became a living soul. Jesus only doing what he sees his father does when he meets his disciples after he has been resurrected. He does the same thing his father did to Adam and he breathed into the disciples. This is when they became born again. Now, spiritually, the seed has changed again. And so the purity of the seed that Adam had in his physical body, now the disciples have spiritually. And so now this is what gives them the power to go out and make replications of themselves. Go out and replicate yourself. Remember, we talked about that just a few, uh, just a few minutes ago. He breathed on them and said, receive you the Holy Spirit. He said, the same spirit that raised me from the dead, boom, I'm giving that to you now. The same spirit that quickened me, boom, I'm giving that to you now. And at this point, this is where the seed changed. And now the disciples and anyone else that receives the spirit of God is created in his image and likeness again. So every man, woman, and child that's ever walked the face of this planet falls into one of two categories. That's it. One of two categories. Either you're created after the image and likeness, the first Adam, or you're created after the image and likeness of the last Adam, which is Christ. See, the first Adam... Again, when he fell, he created something that was after his own image and after his own likeness. No longer after the likeness of God because God hadn't fallen. Adam did. And so now only thing Adam could produce was something else that had fallen. Something else in a fallen state. Jesus comes on the scene, redeems all of mankind, breathes into mankind, and says, receive ye the Holy Spirit Here's a seed change for you, right? And now you're created after the image and likeness of God again because you're created after my image and likeness. Since Jesus is sinless and spotless, he is again in his risen state. No longer is he the sin. No longer is he the curse. He's risen. He's conquered sin. He's conquered death. He's conquered the curse and now he's in the image and the likeness of God, and he gives us the same seed. I hope this is making sense to you. Since you have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the spirit in sincere love of the brethren, love one another fervently with a pure heart, having been 
listen to this, born again, not of a corruptible seed, but an incorruptible through the word of God, which lives and abides forever because all flesh is as grass and all the glory of man as the flower of the grass. The grass withers and the flower falls away, but the word of the Lord endures forever. Peter tells us that we are born again from an incorruptible seed. Remember the seed that we had before is corrupted. So in your born again state, the seed has to change because the seed that causes you to be born again is incorruptible. And you're like, okay, that's a lot of information. That's a lot of stuff. What does that have to do with anything? If we're going to be fruitful, again, we have to make sure we have the right seed. I want to say this, and I said this, I think it was last week, the first time I ever said this. And, and, I, and I'm talking specifically to the believers. Don't spend so much time inspecting fruit that you forget to plant seed. I think so many times we're so concerned with looking for fruit that we don't spend as much time as we need to planting seed. You have to get seed into the ground. Now I do know in a lot of churches, anytime we start talking, planting seed and we're we're automatically going to money. I'm not concerned with money at all. That's not the seed that I'm, I'm talking about. And in fact, I'm going to say this, and it's probably going to bother some people, but you're not going to see money and seed tied together in scripture anywhere. I'll just leave that there. Don't be so involved in inspecting fruit that you forget to plant seed. You have to produce, you have to produce, you have to produce, but what is it that you're supposed to produce? Galatians 5, says this, but the fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace, long suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control against such. There is no law. What am I supposed to be producing? That's the fruit I'm supposed to be producing. In order for me to produce that fruit, I have to have the right seed. And it's important for you to produce this fruit. And this is why. There's some characteristics of fruit that are undeniable. One of the first characteristics of fruit, fruit is attractive. It draws the eye. But think about what it did to the woman in the garden. The Bible says it was good. It looked good to her eye. Fruit draws your attention. It doesn't just draw your attention. It draws the attention of the unbeliever too. When you're at a state of peace, when everybody else is panicking, you look different and the eye is drawn to you. When everybody else gets involved in these crazy, fruitless and pointless conversations, but you choose to abstain, the eye is drawn to you. When you are forgiving and you are loving, the eye is drawn to you. Because this is fruit that we're supposed to produce. Fruit is meant to be shared. It's another characteristic of fruit. It's meant to be shared. Fruit should not spoil on the vine. It's meant to be handed out. It's meant to be shared. Fruit also reproduces itself. Again, it has a seed in it. The more I love uh, uh, someone, the more capacity they can expand themselves for love because fruit will replicate itself. Fruit also nourishes people around you should experience the fruit that you have and they should be nourished by that fruit. We did a podcast, uh, several episodes ago on John 15. And this is the other characteristic of fruit. And I'll say it this way. Fruit doesn't come by works. Fruit does not come by works. Fruit does not come by works. Fruit comes by abiding. You learn to abide in God. 
John 15, 1, I am the true vine. My father is a vine dresses. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bear fruit, he prunes that it might bear more fruit. You are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. Abide in me and I in you as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself. Listen, unless it abides in the vine. You cannot bear fruit unless you are abiding. Doesn't come from works. Church people, it doesn't come from works. It comes by abiding. This is how you bear fruit. Uh, if you get a chance, go back and listen to the podcast on John 15. I think it's called Abide. When you get a chance, it's in season four. It's in this same season. You don't have to go too far back. One of the pictures of this, this fruit and how fruit is supposed to work, you're going to see that. Matthew 21, in verse 18, Now in the morning as he returned to the city, he was hungry. Seeing a fig tree by the road, he came to it and found nothing on it but leaves and said to it, Let no fruit grow on you ever again. Immediately, the fig tree withered away. So if you know anything about the fig trees, the fruit sprouts first and then the leaves come out. So I think it's in Mark. It's either in Mark or Luke. Uh, Don't quote me on that. When you see this story, it says that he saw the tree from a distance. Uh, And seeing the tree from a distance, if you recognize it's a fig tree and it's got leaves on it, then you know there should be fruit. Because the fruit sprouts first, then the leaves. So he goes over to this tree and finds nothing on it but leaves. Nothing but leaves. And he says, I tell you what, don't bear fruit anymore. And this thing withered up and died. Now here's the the gist of this, okay? This tree was proclaiming to be something that it was not. If it had leaves, it should have had fruit. But upon closer inspection, when Jesus came to inspect it closer, to partake of the fruit that it was supposed to have, to enjoy the fruit that it was supposed to have, he looked and there was no fruit and therefore cursed the tree. Some of us have the form of godliness but deny the power thereof. Some, some would proclaim to bear fruit, but upon closer inspection, they're nothing but a bunch of leaves. Make no mistake about it. God will come and inspect. He will come see the fruit that you produce. Are other people supposed to take part or are other people supposed to partake in the fruit that you produce? Of course. But how can they? How can they? If you're not producing anything, how can they if you're constantly pretending to be something that you're not? That's not a seed of righteousness. That's a seed of deception. And now the only thing from that that you can produce is more deception. Remember this, God replicated himself in us. And I know that may not seem like Uh, the most plausible, uh, scenario for most people, but you have to remember this. God had already replicated himself in mankind from the beginning. The serpent tried to convince Adam that he could become something that he already was. He said, you'll be like God, but wait a minute. Let us make man in our image after our likeness. He was already like God. God put his seed in us so that we uh, uh, can replicate him here in the earth. It was always the same from the beginning. Jesus is going to return, and the Bible says he will have a bride without spot or wrinkle. And we are produced from that same seed. There are some of us that will produce for him, and there's some that won't. Now, when I say that, some of us 
will have the appearance of producing for him, but we're really producing for ourselves. Some of us will minister in a capacity only if we can get something out of it. If we're ministering, if we're using our talent, if we're using our gifts, and we say we're doing this for God, but really our heart is what we can get out of it, you're not doing it for God at all. You're doing this for yourself. There are some that will produce for him, and there are some that won't. God knows, he knows which ones are producing. He knows which ones aren't. He knows this. And it's not our job, believer, to always have to point out which ones are not producing for him. Jesus says this. He says, let the wheat and the tear grow up together. He said, in the end, I'll do the separating. Let them grow up together. I'll separate them. He has to separate them. We don't have the ability to separate them. And really, we don't have the ability to separate them because they look so similar. Wheat and tares look so similar that to the point that if you and I decide to go in and separate the two, inevitably what's going to happen, we will damage some of the wheat because it looks so much like the tares. When the wheat and the tares grow up together, there's an easy way to separate the two. If you know what you're looking for, the tares stand up tall and strong and straight where the wheat, the wheat has the seeds or the fruit at the top of the stalk. And because it's bearing fruit, the top of it bends over a little. Whereas the tares stand up tall and strong the wheat, because it bears fruit, it bows. And so God knows which ones are bowing and which ones aren't. He knows which ones have submitted to the Lordship of Jesus Christ and which ones haven't. And so it's his duty to go through and look, says this one, yep, this one has fruit. This one has fruit. Nope, this one, this one doesn't. And it's so interesting that the tares that don't produce any fruit stand up tall and strong, almost like a position of pride. And these are the very ones that God will resist. And the ones that bow is the ones he gives grace to. He resists the proud. He gives grace to the humble. He knows which ones. They look very similar. Because that wheat is heavier on the top because of the fruit, it bows a little bit. Remember this. Jacob had two wives, Rachel and Leah. He loved Rachel. Leah produced him the most amount of sons. While Rachel was barren, seemingly barren, Rachel was not producing for him. She, she was loved by him, but she couldn't produce for him. Leah was the one who was kind of pushed to the side. That's, that's not the one that he really wanted. He really wanted Rachel. That's what he had worked so hard for. He really wanted her. Leah was the one he, he, he kind of settled for. But, but, but that was the one that was producing. Rachel understood he doesn't love Leah. He loves me. But being loved by him was not enough for her. She said this, she told God, she said, give me a child lest I die. I know this man loves me, but that's not enough for me. I need to be able to produce for him. I need to be able to produce for him. And friends and listeners and brothers and sisters, that needs to be our posture when it comes to God. We know that we're loved by him. There's nothing we can do to where he would stop loving us. But at some point in your heart, you have to have the same cry that Rachel has. Give me a child lest I die. Yeah, I know you love me. I got to produce for you. I have to produce for you. Because you told me. Be fruitful. 
I want to produce for you. Being fruitful is a command for us, not a suggestion. Make sure you have the right seed. We'll see you next time under the fig tree.